So we uh, have got some great insight. Part of that insight was what gets you in the door. It's not problems, it's not a sense of entitlement, it's game-changing solutions and numbers. Now, how you make sure your science is considered a game changer and how you get those numbers is part of what our next talk is about. We have two professional science communicators, professional in not only their public personas and the work that they do communicating science directly, but also in the research they do at the Australian National University. Dr. Rob Lamets is Deputy Director of the Centre for Public Awareness of Science at ANU, and Will Grant, who they'll be speaking together, is a researcher there in the same centre. He researches the interaction between science, policy and climate change, and Rod Lambert delivers science communication courses and has for many, many years. I know a few of them through their Twitter profiles that are very active. Uh, and they will have two sessions this afternoon. It will start now, they have approximately 40 minutes, then we'll have a quick convenience break. Uh, that's the way you say it apparently. And that will be a very quick break. They'll come back and the first thing we're gonna talk about is getting your science out of the lab. I'm hoping that they're somewhere. There they are. <laughs> Welcome to the stage. Okay, so would you like to be up here or? Yeah? We'd like you on stage. A little bit um, worried by being introduced as professionals. It doesn't really help to have that image in your head. Well, the previous exercise was recognition of prior learning for the experts. <laughs> uh, we all know that unless it's published, it doesn't actually exist. And these guys are publishing actively in science communication. So please welcome to the stage. <laughs> This is where I do a microphone check, is that all right? I could probably not need to use a microphone, but apparently that's not the go for recording, having someone screaming at you from across the stage. Thanks for the invite, SMP. We've been here before, we've come back again. Katrina Jackson has put a lot of faith in us, which is, uh, we hope we can... We I can don't know, maybe, maybe previous um, <laughs> owners of the SMP brand were tricked her into something here. This has happened. We, um, we, what we want to do today, the, the main purpose of us here today is to get you guys doing stuff. Not embarrassing juggling, you don't have to prove any tricks you use with your uh, children at Christmas dinners or anything. But what we want to do is give you a chance of practicing doing a 60 second pitch of your science. A 60 second pitch. However, that's going to happen after the, what was it called, convenience break? The convenient, after the convenience break. So if you get a bit nervous by the idea, We'll let you know before you go to the convenience break what we're going to have you do, and then you can have a little think about that over the convenience break before we get you back and yakking. But first up, what do you reckon we ought to do? Talk to people about what we do? Well, look, I think, I think we can explain a little bit about um, our background and who we are and the sorts of stuff that we work on. Um, and then I think one of the interesting things that hopefully we could do here is drawing from our background and our expertise and the sorts of research and work that we do, uh, try and spend a bit of time maybe ground-truthing um, some of the stuff that you've heard today. Mm. You've heard from a lot of different experts, from a lot of the, um, the fields between the interaction between science and policy. Uh, in our centre, we're academics, we're uh, researchers and um, science communicators. We work on the interaction between science and society and science and policy. We do. And our goal, I think, in this, in this next um, 30 minutes is not to spend another 30 minutes yapping at you. You've heard some great things from a lot of good speakers and I don't think that we can contribute by spending another 30 minutes yapping at you. Just 28 minutes. Exactly, yeah. and then two minutes. What we'd, what we'd actually like to do is, is um, give you a chance to try and um, ground truth some of, some of the things that you've heard. Try and fit that all into context and see what it all means for you. And we'll just go, I mean, where we're from, we, our centre focuses on uh, best ways to communicate science, ways to think about audiences, ways to get your message from the bench out there into the real world. Um, but what we're not, we're not lobbyists and we're not, uh, we're not politicians. So what you might find is what we have to say or our opinions may contradict at times because we don't have a specific political, I suppose, expertise in that regard. What we are is generic, particularly science folks, comms people. So we'll try and answer questions for you and we'll try and make some points and indeed tease out some points from what the session we just heard, but based on comms expertise. So if you're finding it sounds contradictory, that because it is? What we want to say is that um, 
in a way that most of the speakers here um, haven't been, is we're from your realm. We work in the university sector. We, knows that, we know the ways that specific languages operate within the research sectors. We, knows, we know how the difficulties of those things operate when trying to communicate with different worlds. So we want to throw over to you. Are there things that you've heard throughout today, contradictions that you might have heard, things that have been bubbling away in your head? You're thinking, why did that guy in the morning say this, and why did someone else in the afternoon say that? So if you do have questions, we'd like to have more of a discussion than talk to you for the next 28 minutes. Of course, we can talk at you for the whole time. Ah, oh, thank Mercifully, someone put their hand up. Brave soul at the back. We'll just make uncomfortable silence filling noises until a microphone works its way up to the end. I can do thinking music. Think Think thinking beatbox. <laughs> Not too late. <laughs> Sorry, that no, would be mind. terribly embarrassing. G'day, guys. Uh, Jeremy Branley from STI. I'm the Secretary of STI and also uh, from Griffith University. Talking to a number of delegates, I think there's a general anxiety around the purpose of the meeting. I think for, for a number of them they're saying uh, they're meeting with people that don't necessarily have an obvious link with their research. Um, and so I guess it'd be great to get some just general feedback on engaging uh, with those, for those people in that situation. I think also emphasising that need that one of the comments that was made in the last session, it's a continuing conversation. This is the first conversation. Uh, and I guess how to build on build that conversation after the meeting's finished. I have to say the first thing that struck me, I suppose it vaguely answers this question, but it's also a generic point. At first when I was listening to the, the lobbyist conversation about you need evidence, you need compelling narrative, but you need numbers, but you need to offer game-changing ideas and you need to talk about growth, I was starting to get more and more nervous because a lot of those things are not what we would um, suggest if you're trying to communicate with a human being. Then it came back to that, that point that all politics is personal. And I think I'd take out politics and say all communication is personal. And one of the things I think that underlies all this is, is the idea that you want to know what you're trying to say and you want to talk to the people you're talking to like they're people. And try and get yourself in the head of the people you're speaking with and imagine what they'd like to hear and how they might like to hear it. Um, and that's a good kickoff, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think um, going back to your point about anxiety, I think that's utterly understandable. Mm. Um, having anxiety about meeting someone um, in a position of power or someone from a very different realm is utterly common. You know, we've all experienced the, the thing where you, the difference between going to a party where it's all your friends and going to a party where you know one person. Massive difference in anxiety. We know that there's a lot of different things going on. We don't know how to operate. We don't know what's going on there. And going into a meeting with a politician that you might not necessarily know OK, what's, what's their agenda? What, what do they want? What's the purpose of this meeting? I, I agree, that can be a very difficult thing to, to recognise. I think the thing to say at this point is that the politician, in this sense, has agreed to have this meeting. And so they're happy with, let's not, let's not go beyond that in terms of purpose, let's just start engagement. Let's hear about each other's rep worlds, um, the th sorts of things that um, you're working on, that I'm working on, try and build some sort of common ground. I think common ground is a, is a great place to start any communication and then you can build from there. And common ground may have nothing to do with your work. I think there's a danger, especially if you're all psyched up, like tomorrow when you're speaking to politicians and your head's going to be full of the particular science agenda or the money agenda or the, the issue you want to get out there and you walk up there and you'll start blabbering out all about your stuff while you need to be succinct with your time. Again, they're human beings. They might not seem like it, but I have it on good authority. A lot of the politicians are human beings. So if you start to talk to them like people, you might have a better chance of cutting through a little bit. How you do that is going to be quite particular to the individuals and, and to your own personal style. That's um, another danger with events like this. You may feel implicitly pushed to change your own personal style or, or adopt a persona that you don't have. Um, I wouldn't recommend that personally. I don't know. Would you recommend that? Change, no. your, change your personality, Will. I, 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 I probably wouldn't recommend changing your personality. I mean, you do tailor. We all tailor our personalities to different audiences. You know, you reflect different things in different places. but. Um, don't, be, don't, don't perform. Um, recognising what, what your goals are and talking like a human is always, always critical to these sorts of meetings. And recognise when the meeting, in this sort of sense, isn't necessarily going to get to the details that you want. But finding something that um, you agree on, some sort of commonality, is a good start for later engagement. Yeah, one, a, one little thing is better than... One little thing that worked is better than a whole bunch of things that didn't. 
Don't fall into the scientist trap of saying, I need to tell you all the details. Oh, I've given you that detail, now I have to give you a caveat. You probably heard this from the journalists and media people earlier this morning. I'm looking for any recognition. One head nod and a bunch of blank stares. Was everyone here for the journalists this morning? A little bit? No, kind of. Um, if connection's the first issue, just pick one thing. Just pick one thing. That, that can be enough. Especially if you're speaking, as the question came about, an ongoing dialogue. If you give them everything, then what, what are they left to be hungry about too, I suppose, another question. The other thing I'd say, and I, and I apologise, we are actually yapping here, but throw your hand Bound up to happen. Um, at any moment, um, that the art of um, this sort of fast engagement Although we'll probably spend um, the later session seeing how you can get your science into a, into a three minute, um, not quite sound bite, a massive art is actually listening. Listening to the other person and, and, and it's hearing their values, hearing what motivates their world, hearing what motivates them in terms of their political decision making. If you're spending 90% 90, 90 of the conversation talking, you're in trouble. If Speaking it's of which, was that a question? There you go. There we go. Uh, Graham Lamb. It's more um, wanting you to give some uh, thoughts and maybe everybody in general that the fundamental problem with scientists, maybe particularly the physical, uh, biological scientists who have really been brought up to pursue a problem and your whole approach is you never prove anything. All you do is throw up hypotheses and you disprove them. And your incredible weakness, and I think this is what's happened with the climate change debate and other debates, that when it comes to what's acceptable in the community, it is beyond reasonable doubt. But that's not good enough for a scientist because somebody can say, well, there's always this, have you tested that? And you, it always gets put back, well, can you be absolutely certain? And of course, our whole upbringing is to say, no, that's not the way we work. But it's time that people stop presenting it that way and falling back on it because I feel that's a weakness. It, science seems to need, really should be adopting the legal absolute uh, acceptable limit of beyond reasonable doubt and not proof because that's what the society expects but we're not being constrained by our own uh, you know, unnecessary ties. This is a, uh, for one of a better way of putting it, quite a political question. I've actually written a piece that's been quite uh, provocative on exactly that issue about climate communication just recently in the conversation. Um, the extent to which you use your facts to try and push your argument is a big question. I don't think we can answer that for you. You have to make a decision about what your goals are and whether you're comfortable with that. Um, you're right, scientists are trained to put in all the questions, have not, not proved but failed to disprove, all that good stuff. What's your goal? If you're trying to get published in a journal, keep running that path. If you're trying to get on, on the news for, for good reasons, if you're trying to get into a politician's aide's ear and try and get them to listen to you, then maybe you have to reconsider the extent to which you want to express that uncertainty, at least in the opening conversations. Not misrepresent, but think about the words that you're going to use and how you're going to use them. There's a, um, another way of thinking about this as well, that um, politicians don't actually act in certainty at all. Um, we might, we might recognise that as scientists we can't answer that question. We can't say unequivocally, 100% climate is changing, uh, humans cause that kind of thing. We, we do have to equivocate, that's how we're trained. Um, but politicians don't act in a, in, a, in a realm of certainty. They don't know what's going to happen in three years' time in the economy. They don't know what's going to happen in ten years' time in demographics, all sorts of things. But they have to make decisions still. And so they act in, in terms of uh, risk calculations. What, what, is the, what is the hazard of this thing happening? What is the likelihood of it happening? And I think we do have to frame our climate communications in particular in terms of risk um, communication. We have to say the, the risks of us not acting on this fact far outweigh the risks of us acting on this fact and being wrong, because of, that's a pretty small likelihood, but the likelihood if, we're, um, if we don't act and things going to hell in a handbasket is actually quite high. So yeah. I think that changes away from that certainty language and gives us, um, is it riskier to operate from this perspective or that perspective is a better way than say, um, than trying to give politicians certainty. And I don't believe they actually truly do want certainty. Yeah, they'd love it. I mean, if they could, if they could have a, a realm of certainty, it'd make their jobs much easier, but they don't expect it anywhere else. I think also we've been, we've been stealth uh, communicated with here by Kylie Walker up the back of the room from the Australian Academy of Science, communication supremo and expert, asking us potentially to offer you some ideas about tips for achieving clarity in communicating complicated science without dumbing it down. 
communicated, uh, complicated science without dumbing it down. This, my, my first approach would be don't look at the, do what they, they probably advise you to do this morning. What's the punchline? What's the big issue you want to get through as a result of your research? What's the thing that's going to be meaningful to the audience you're dealing with? And give them that first. Don't fall back on all the details, whatever you do. And Rod, Rod said the key, key word I think there is meaningful. What's mm. going to be meaningful to your audience? What's going to be the thing that resonates with their thinking, their, their change of um, behaviour or what they're worried about? What's going to mean something in terms of your research? And, and know you, when to stop. Know when to stop. This is one of the problems. I, I, when I started being a comms guy rather than a pure science guy, although my science is psychology, I don't know how the people in the room feel about that. I'm They're all delighted, I'm obviously. I'm a political scientist, political so I don't count scientist. Um, I'd just been teaching a class on psychom, how to talk to media, all the wonderful stuff. Then someone interviewed me on my PhD research, and I sounded like a twit. I just babbled out every caveat. I started quoting numbers. I put in p-values. Just what newspapers are looking for. They cannot get enough p-values. They can't get enough stats. But in fairness, it is, it is the realm in which we're most used to talking about mm. our research. 99% of your conversations about your research will be with your colleagues, with your students, in the department seminar, um, perhaps when you, you're going for um, funding or something like that. Most of it is in your realm. So when you talk about it, you're used to saying all mm. those things, and they're meaningful in your realm. Absolutely. But not in the realm of politics or in the realm of wider society. You've got to resist. I, I had a, a psychology professor who worked, her research was on adolescence, and she was great. She'd come into our, our methods courses and say, look, I've been designing this questionnaire. It's for 15-year-old boys. My husband's a, a builder's labourer, and I test all my stuff on him. <laughs> and she wasn't denigrating her husband. She was making the point that she tested it on someone who had nothing to do with her realm, was certainly not psych trained, certainly not a stats guy, um, and if it, if it passed the husband test, I don't know if you all have husbands, you can do this with your biology or whatever research, but if it passed her test or his test, then it could go further. And this is probably similar. To try it around the dinner table too. Try it with your mates when you're having a few drinks. Obviously low alcoholic because you've got a big day tomorrow. But try it on them. See if it makes sense. And anything they go, what are you talking about? Egghead, cut it out. If you can't explain it, cut it out. And you shouldn't do it all yourself. There's a question just over the back. Yep. But you're the experts in your scientific field you're not the experts in communicating that necessarily. Go out and talk to people, go, and, go out and talk to the science communicators at your university or your institution, or just talk to other people who might have done similar sorts of things. Look for expertise. We do it in, in our science, we should do it in our community. Oh, don't be afraid to bugger it up. Question over there. Oh, I'm glad to bugger it up, because I'm certain <laughs> to do that. Um, Preempting nicely. The, um, the sort of dilemma that's giving me an ulcer is that you're being told to be really strategic and sort of speak to these people and things they care about and things they understand. And you're also told, you know, speak with enthusiasm about your research. Well, I work on environmental water and climate change. If I speak with enthusiasm to the person I'm meeting tomorrow, he's not going to like me very much. Um, I'm going to have to be very strategic. And, and I guess that, that's the sort of way you sort of end up torn between sort of saying what you know they want to hear and actually saying the things that you're really passionate about. I think there's, I think there's something important to be said in this that, um, doom and gloom stories, everything's going to hell in a handbasket, don't offer us a solution. Politicians need a solution. They need an action point, something that they can do. They need something to latch on to. Everyone needs it. If we were to say, well, my research has shown that pretty much there's nothing we can do about the climate, we're all stuffed, um, what's a politician going to say? Is that what your research is telling us? <laughs> <laughs> don't talk to them. Just don't worry about it. But if we do have some sort of way out, if there is a way that a politician can say, if we can say to a politician, perhaps if we were to invest money here, perhaps if we can think about these new avenues, there's ways to change. If we have a, a, a way out or a glimmer of hope, then people can latch onto it. Doom and gloom, there's nothing you can do with that. And, and you don't have to tell your whole story again. If there's something in there you can say, look, I've got a, there's something in here that could be quite useful, people could use, could be positive, could be an action-based activity, so to speak. Maybe try leading with that. And when they ask for all the, the doom and gloom behind it, then you can give them a big you know, appendix full of tables and stuff and let the staffers read it. Are there any other Just over here. questions? There was hands. Well, I think repeatedly, I mean, what we do with comms all the time, students, uh, colleagues, senior and junior scientists, know your audience, know your audience, know your audience. Get an angle on the people you're, you're speaking with, what it is they're into, and, and how can what you're doing relate directly to that? That's more important than talking all about your science. Before, before yep. we go to that question, I just want to pick up on know your audience, because I know it's something that um, communicators will often say, know your audience, but how do you go about that? It's magic. actually an important thing, magic. magic. You just know it. 
Um, we Go actually on. have to be strategic in that. And actually, there's, there's ways to do research on your audience. Uh, it depends who they are. But you can do a lot of that research online. You can, you can um, if you're talking to a politician, you can read things they've written, or you can listen to their speeches. If you are doing, um, say you're doing, um, looking at breast cancer gene or something like that, um, you can know more about the people who are mo most likely to be considering that test by going on to certain blogs online where they talk about those sorts of issues. Reading them, paying attention to them will actually be a really valuable place to find the people who will be affected by your research. You don't have to do it all the time, but occasionally dipping into the world of the people who will be the end users of your research can be incredibly valuable. I think it was over here somewhere. There it was. I've um, attended uh, lots of meetings where, um, where we, we get to the end and it's, it's that, uh, the issue around what are the next steps and somebody said that in the previous session. I think the next steps are critically important and I think um, it's really important going into a meeting to have a sense of what you want those next steps at the end to be. So if you think about what the outcomes of these meetings are going to be tomorrow, um, what you want them to be, uh, and so when you get to the end of the conversation, it'll be, you know, what's the next step? If you've never met this person before, it's probably just, well, I'll send you some links or I'll, you know, do those, send, I'll send you something in the mail or whatever else. But it is important to think about the next steps before you walk in in the first place. I think that way you'll, you'll get an outcome, which I, otherwise I, I, a conversation just may be kind of, you know, I agree entirely. and get nowhere. So. Yeah, you're and not going in there to give a seminar. Small. You're not going in to say, I just want to tell about my science. Here's fun, I'm going to interest you for five minutes. You need a purpose and couldn't agree. And it shouldn't be big. You know, I, I don't think you can say next steps is you signing a check for a billion dollars. You know, the next step could Style be, the hundred thousand um, could be coming, vi come and visit my lab or, or we can show you some of these things or I can say keeping them, keeping them small, keeping that engagement um, just at a low level allows it to tick up to a bigger conversation later. Can I also ask you, what do you think of the, of the anecdote as a, as a means of getting a message across? So an anecdote about, you know, what happened? you know, about your, your kids or their kids or, or you know... An, your an anecdote to your get the message and, across or an anecdote just to be comsy, folksy and happy? No, 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 an anecdote to get a message across. So if you're trying to say, for example, that, um, uh, that, that parents don't understand maths as a career and, and you can tell an anecdote where you were somewhere and there were 100 people there and you asked them how many, of, you know, how, there were maths people and you said to them, how many of you are here against the wishes of your parents? Right, that sort of story as opposed mm. to yep. keeping it abstract. Is, is that useful or do people get allergic to anecdotes and think, oh no, you know. 100%. Uh, it, it's got to, it's got to agree with your data. You have to have the underlying data to say, you know, to follow your example, 70% of students are turned off by maths education, whatever it is. But if then you can illustrate that with a qualitative example, basically this is, you know, sort of quantitative, qualitative mixed methods. If you can illustrate that with an anecdote, then the politician will understand so much better. Everyone understands mm. anecdotes really quite easily. Well, also, we love stories. I mean, that's the bottom line. We all like stories. We might not admit it. We might have denied it now that we've become old and serious and we only care about stats. But we love to hear tales. And politicians aren't immune within parameters of reality of their jobs, but they're not immune. I think, I think they're, not, they're not a replacement for data. They parallel data Anecdata. enormously. We need well, more anecdata. Up the back. To a minister or a member of parliament or senator, how broad should you talk about the science that you're doing? So, for example, uh, if you're in the field of neuroscience, would you just talk basically about why it's important to fund research in neuroscience, or do you keep it much more focused and say this is the aspect of that work that I'm interested in and I think this is why it needs funding? I'd start with my research can do X and that's why it's important to you, and whether you call it neuroscience or not doesn't matter a damn. It might end up being talking about neuroscience, but it's a it's a really common thing and we're trying to think in our institutional and disciplinary silos. And so when you approach it from that categorisation, you're not necessarily opening with anything useful to people. But you open with, I'm doing this research that does this for children, blah, 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 blah. I'm in the bio neuroscience area of X. That's a different story. But I mean, the word's impact always, isn't it? You know, what's the impact, a relevant impact? And I think there's, there's always going to be an enormous amount of listening going on. You, you, you really want to be, in those first words, listening as hard as you can to what they're resonating with. If you say a sentence that straight away you can tell they, they, they didn't understand that term, back off and give them a, um, uh, a, a wider description or something until, until you can get a sentence they understand and then guide them along there. The instant you've lost someone, you need to, you need to stop and recalculate and think, okay, um, what's, what's the framing that they will understand? So 
you might get some people, and there are certainly scientists up there that are incredibly knowledgeable at, about some scientific fields. So you might dive in there, and they start asking you questions that are pretty close to the questions that your, your colleagues might ask you. Um, but you'll get others that will say, slow down, slow down, slow down, I don't understand what the brain is, maybe. But we have, what we'll do, we'll take one more question, unless there are other burning ones, and then what we want to do is just preempt what's going to happen after you've had your convenience break. So question over here first. Well, mine is a bit of a comment to a comment. ameliorate some of the anxiety as well. We're all here as members of professional associations and a lot of those professional associations have worked pretty hard to hammer out position papers on particular aspects and to work out their line of advocacy. And I think going into those meetings tomorrow, if one of the things we can do is say, well, here is a personal representative of that professional association. If you need more information on a particular topic that I'm not an expert in, I can find it for you, I can get you in there, we've got a great association. That kind of thing can actually deal with a whole lot of difficult situations when that Member of Parliament asks a question that you're not actually familiar with or takes the agenda outside of your area of expertise. Um, and I wondered whether you guys could reflect, have you seen professional associations when they've been active advocating science, have you seen good examples where they have actually been able to move that agenda forward? Hmm. Pregnant pause. I'm not sure. Actually. Look, I think, I think the difficulty we have there is that um, good advocacy of science happens typically um, behind closed doors, and we don't we don't see the results very much because it's a nice, smooth political process. It's it's where uh, a visionary idea in the scientific sector finds resonance in the in the political sector, and then we end up with um, either a great investment or a great um, way of rethinking our hospitals or whatever, whatever it is. Um, the, the problems, you know, they're, they're, they're very different. So I think it's difficult to point to the ways that good ad advocacy has happened without, except to say it's long and it continues to happen. You need to have that ongoing engagement. You need to have that ongoing connection. The one thing I just wanted, wanted to add in terms of um, your association and being able to pass you on to other people, we do that all the, all the time in the scientific world. We always say, okay, well, I don't know 100% about that, but I know someone who does. And you can, and I think thinking of ourselves in a network way and, and setting up a, a point, a bridge between the political world and the scientific world, you're just a point. You're just a node in this network. And hopefully what you can do is then connect the politician with the wider scientific world so that they can start thinking, OK, I, I don't know anything about um, uh, whales, for instance, but I know a shark expert. I know someone who can ask these sorts of... And they're of both fish. Yeah, exactly. So I, know. I know, but they're in the yeah. ocean. It's yeah, close enough. Um, it's closer than you know, asking um, the neuroscientist down the back. So it's, it's, we've, we've got to work in a, in a network way of, of connecting people with expertise. And they're not going to get it straight away, but helping people out can be incredibly valuable. Yeah, you're not alone. I mean, I'm going to be talking to some people tomorrow about this too. Like, comms expertise is actually a thing. And if you're good at your science and you're trying to do some comms and you find you don't really like it, or it's just not your thing, it's okay. I think there's a danger when you get spoken at by comms people in particular, and in SciComm even more so, there's this implication that all scientists should be excellent at it. You should all be great in front of a microphone, you should be able to get up in front of a crowd like this and work the room, kiss the baby, shake the hands, etc. It's okay if you're not. You know, today and tomorrow might give you a few more tips, it might make you better at asking other people to do it for you, and similarly calling on the professional associations. It's alright if you're not good at it. You know, I always say this, I, I want my cancer researchers curing the cancers that I may get later. I don't care if they're talking to the newspapers at all, personally. Um, unless they want to, of course, we're, in, we're grand enablers. But it's all right, it's all right not to be a comms person. So don't get the wrong impression, so to speak. I guess the problem is when no one's doing it. Yes, yeah, some of you have to be comms people. <laughs> Just a few. Just eight. We'll pick eight. We'll, we'll find eight. Well, this eight. might be the method, the segue here. We're going <laughs> to pick, pick the eight that are going to be the comms people. Maybe, maybe Here's something we prepared that. earlier. This is the first thing we prepared earlier. <laughs> We, um, what we're going to do with you before your break, um, no, after your break, we're going to give you the opportunity, not the challenge, the opportunity, so you're all very excited and happy now, to talk about a piece of your own research or your area for 30 to 60 seconds, a 30 to 60 second pitch. So the plan will be, at your, you don't have to do this now, have your tea and coffee and a, a wee wee break, but before that, I mean after that, at your tables we'll be getting you to give a, a 60 second pitch, no more, we're time Nazis, anything over 60 seconds. The hammer comes down. Well, you'll have to be time Nazis for yourself. You'll, you'll have to self Nazi yourselves, but afterwards we'll be the Nazis. So, 60 second pitch about your work, some aspect of your work, not all your work. Anyone who tries to do all their work, I want to hear the tables booing them. 
Imagine this in terms of uh, perhaps the politician that you're going to talk to tomorrow. What would be meaningful to them? Mm. What's the 30 to 60 seconds that would provide a meaningful um, thing to them? And the action item, the what can we do next? What's the way forward? And what will happen after that? You'll all do your pitch. You'll pick table winners. We'll take the table winners aside. They'll do some arm wrestling and feats of strength to decide who the top five? Top five people, do you reckon? After that, should we have yes, five? Yes, five. 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 Hello, Will. Yeah, I lost the semi-final thread. So table, table off table winners, and then we need to semi-final, and then Almost we get five, too five people up on the audience. stage. So we'll get five people up on the stage. Bear in mind, if you don't want to get up here on the stage and do your 60-second pitch, make sure you lose around your table. <laughs> but there is a trick to that. Don't be the person that, you know, the last person to step back. So. Yeah. But we'll give you more detail, not too much more, but a little and bit more detail. And I believe that um, Katrina has supplied us a, a bottle of... Um, Whiskey or something like that for the winner? I don't know. I heard it was a I, car. I, I, I think Katrina's <laughs> looking daggers the at winner, me. Right? The winner gets a Rolls Royce classic oh, Silver right. Ghost. <laughs> sponsored by the wealthy coffers of science. It might be sponsored by government too, I heard. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe, um, look, we have a couple more minutes if you want to use it. Does anyone have any other questions? Can we make you more anxious about what we're doing after the break? We can. I'm just wondering if you want to be made It's going to be really nerve-wracking. Terrifying. That, we're, we're the most terrifying. Hello. I thought I'd just change the topic a bit. I'm <laughs> Melanie Eyre from Cyro. You two are obviously really, really good communicators. Can you say something about how you got into it in the first place? Uh, accident and drinking heavily. <laughs> Not only. Um, how did we get into comms at all? I got into comms because I've always been a blabbermouth. I enjoyed debating as a kid. You thought you guys were nerds. I was in the debate club. Um, and then I found SciComm by accident as well. And they keep enabling me to do this instead of sit in the lab and, and write papers or put electrodes onto children and then on rats, which was my psych background, none of the electrodes. And um, it just became more fun. There was practice. Before I gave my first lecture, I had to pretty much change my underwear. I was terrified. Um, and that kind of got better. Practice. Yeah, I think, and there there is a lot to be said for um, yeah. The more you, the more you do it, the more it will happen. Um, it, it doesn't have to be you. For some people, that's okay. You can step back, but 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 just practicing, rehearsing your lines over and over again with different people, and that's why you know they call it the the barbecue um, stopper or something like that. The, the words that they the barbecue stopper. Yeah, yeah, the words that resonate at a barbecue uh -huh. will be the words that resonate um, with a politician will be the words that resonate in, in wider circles. There are other ways to stop a barbecue, though, that don't involve communication. Sure, sure, do it. Don't, like. don't use those. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, it is practice. Also, um, like what I often tell students who are learning how to uh, give presentations, often, I don't know about you guys, but you get up here and you think, everyone's in charge of me and I'm terrified. Uh, the reverse is true. You're in charge of everyone now. If I hadn't told you that, I bet I could have got you to get up, sit down, spin around in circles, bang your legs, most of you would do that if I put it in some meaningful You can't do that to a context. politician tomorrow, though. You can. Right. Tip. You can. Con <laughs> contradictory advice. Actually, they probably will could, remember you. Probably you. could. You know, my science. <laughs> yeah, I've, got, I've got a demonstration. What do you need? <laughs> yeah, the handstand. Um, but you're in charge of the room, and it's okay to be in charge of the room when you're presenting. I don't think people often think of that. The whole idea of um, imagining people in their underwear is terrible. Some of you are very attractive, but as I look around the room, if I imagine you all in your underwear, I'm not having a good day anymore. <laughs> I don't recommend that technique. Mate. Oh, you look great. You Thank look great. you. So, that, the, yeah, it's practice. Do the, do the courses. Get the, get the training. Um, don't be afraid to stuff it up. Public speaking is scary. Um, writing maybe isn't as scary. I think practicing, there are so many venues now to practice writing in a more English to English human way. Um, Which is a valuable place to, to hone all of these sorts of skills. Yeah. Um, places like the conversation and things like that are a great way for working scientists to think, okay, how can I get into um, a wider realm of, of discussion? Mm. And um, who's going to, not hold my hand, who's going to show me the doors and the ways through? Well, who's going to edit you well? Yeah, well, that too. They have a great flock of editors. Don't take it personally, too. If someone's attacking, sorry, helping you with your work, take it as help, because they're usually pretty good at it. So, yeah, put yourselves in the hands of editors and people who know what they're doing. Some of you will get really good at it. Some of you will be terrible. Some of you might be okay but hate it. But like anything, admitting, oh. admitting mistakes, admitting your problems um, resolves, resolves them the fastest way. Saying, oh, I stuffed up that speech, or halfway through you made, you made an error, you can just admit it and keep moving. Yeah, confessions are good, so at least a bit. If you, um, if you do muck it up, don't pretend you didn't. 
And back to the person who's not there anymore's question. Oh, there you are. Um, don't pretend you know stuff you don't, except for comedic effect. Um, and even then, it doesn't always work. If, if you get caught in a situation you don't know something, I found one of the best, the best things I learned as a teacher in particular is saying I don't know. The more I tell students I don't know stuff, the more they think I actually know. It's that Monty Python scene, he is the Messiah, no he's not, I'm not claiming to be the Messiah. But as long as you say I don't know, people think you're really confident in your knowledge. So I don't know how to help you. No idea. <laughs> that was a fair bit of I don't know though. I don't know. I think we have to stop for a moment for convenience. Thank you very much guys. <laughs>